Brilliant. So um, I'm Liz Hargreaves and Laura Keyes and Vary Brown are here with me today. We're from the uh, FRS research team in ONS and um, we are responsible for delivering data to DWP on the Family Resources Survey. So today we're just going to give you an update on developments in FRS fieldwork over the 21-22 survey year. So that was the year leading up to uh, March just gone. Um, so I'm going to start with a recap of fieldwork up to April 2021. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a quick summary of operational developments. Um, so firstly, the completion of the Not to Nudge rollout and then a small scale face to face trial. Next, I'll cover the biggest development of the year, which was the launch of the FRS Boost. Uh, then I'll be handing over to Laura and Vari, who are each going to present the results from an experiment which was carried out late in 21-22. And finally, I'll wrap up with a few thoughts about what we've got planned for 22-23. So in terms of what fieldwork looked like previously, uh, this slide here summarises the approach before COVID, which I hope most of you be familiar with. So basically, uh, we used to send a letter to respondents, which uh, included an unconditional post office voucher for £10. And the interviewer would then follow up with by visiting the address. And when they made contact, they would seek to uh, complete the interview in person in the, interview, in the respondent's house. Um, this slide summarises our response to COVID, which was in the year 2021. So that's the year that was just recently published by DWP. We made lots of adaptations to enable fieldwork to continue amidst the restrictions. And these included no small adjustment to telephone interviewing and uh, various adjustments which enabled us to get contact details. So telematching, uh, the introduction of an internet portal and the adjustment which had the biggest impact was not to nudge at the bottom of the slide. So building on the success of the Not to Nudge, uh, we continued the rollout into the, the following survey year, the 21-22, which we're talking about now. Um, so I'll just give you a quick reminder of what Not to Nudge is. I did present this last year. Uh, basically, what we did was interviewers who had been unable to make contact by the telephone were uh, sorry, for cases where uh, contact hadn't been achieved by telephone, uh, interviewers were sent out to visit those addresses. And if they made contact, they would have a doorstep conversation. They didn't uh, enter the house um, and they would seek to collect a telephone number and to make an appointment to complete the interview over telephone. So as I mentioned, it was launched in November 2020 and by March 2021, we had rolled that out across the whole of the GB, uh, Great Britain. but. Uh, Northern Ireland had yet to implement, so they had some trials scheduled for spring 21, but those got postponed and eventually went ahead in June 21, so within the 21-22 survey year. And as a result, they were able to fully implement Not to Nudge from July 21, meaning that we had full UK coverage. Uh, the impact of Not to Nudge, as I mentioned, was quite significant. So in November 2020, we saw um, a 12 percentage point increase month on month when it was introduced in, in GB. And in Northern Ireland, we saw a similar impact with response rates increasing from 22% to 49.5%. Another operational development that I wanted to mention is a small scale trial carried out of face to face interviewing under post COVID conditions. So this was undertaken by ONS between August and December 2021 and considered how face-to-face -face processes need to be rethought in light of COVID restrictions and changes in public attitudes. Some uh, elements which we considered included how long interviewers should wait before in entering the respondent's property, whether masks should be mandatory, whether vaccination status should be declared, and how to reintroduce show cards. And as a result of the trial, some measures implemented were screening questions around COVID symptoms, uh, which we uh, interviewers were instructed to ask ahead of entering the house. Some guidance given to respondents about how to prepare the interview space, for instance, opening windows and minimising the number of people in the room. Um, interviewers were required to wear masks, uh, but it was decided that it would be optional for respondents. Uh, similarly, interviewers were not at uh, instructed not to ask respondents about their vaccination status and they were advised that if the respondent asked them what theirs was then they had to it was completely up to them what how they answered they, they could choose to reveal or not reveal. Uh, similarly uh, we 
instructed interviewers to offer breaks because obviously the FRS can be quite a long interview uh, and it was up to the respondent whether they wanted to take those breaks. Uh, finally, on show cards, we took the opportunity to reintroduce show cards. So uh, a, a reduced pack containing just those questions which were hardest to ask without the show cards was produced uh, and the pack was laminated so that they could be wiped clean between use. Now I'm going to talk about the biggest development of the year, which was the launch of the FRS Boost. So obviously Mark already referenced the fact that uh, we mm -hmm. were tasked with delivering a um, roughly two and a half times boost. Um, in, in fact, it was, to be precise, a 2.4 times boost. So um, due to a couple of factors, it was launched in stages. Uh, Initially, funding was confirmed only for the Scottish Boost, so the Scottish Boost launched in April 2021, uh, and then England and Wales funding was secured later, um, which meant that we were able to launch from October 21 in England and Wales. There were also some complications with regards to contra contractual limits, which meant that the England-Wales launch needed to be phased. So in October 21, we launched a 1.9 times boost, with the full boost coming into play from April 22, so that'll be the next survey year. This slide here shows the size of the boost implemented within each of the four nations. So um, first you can see that Northern Ireland um, didn't actually have any boost as it was already sufficiently oversampled. And similarly, Scotland had already got in place quite a significant oversampling. Consequently, only a small additional boost was implemented there. By contrast, in Wales, there was no prior boost, so a large boost of three times was uh, required to support the regional analysis, which was spoken about before. Um, in England, the picture is a bit more complicated as uh, the boost varies by region, with some regions receiving a similar boost to that implemented in Wales, uh, for example, northeast England, and other regions uh, receiving a lower boost, which was, for example, southeast England and London. Um, in terms of delivering the boost, there were two main focuses for my team. Um, first was amending the sample design and the second was ramping up the field work. So for 21-22, uh, because the fund, by the time the funding had been approved, we'd already drawn the PSUs, the primary sampling units, sorry, primary section units. Um, the only option that we had was to select additional addresses uh, from within the PSUs already selected. So that meant that interviewers were working with very large quotas um, of varying sizes across the country. Um, so for 22-23, we in introduced a, a preferable solution, which was to um, select additional PSUs uh, appropriately spread out across the country in order to deliver the boost as required by region, um, but with equal quotas of 28 addresses. Um, looking at the fieldwork side, uh, so the, the Scottish boost was relatively minor. So for us, the focus on fieldwork ramp, ramp up was that October launch. Um, we had a big push across the summer to ensure that sufficient interviewers were trained on FRS. And uh, as a result, we launched successfully in October 21. And you can see there that thanks to that boost, uh, the, the achieved sample in 21-22 was 63% higher than in 2021 at 16,400 households, which uh, is obviously still lower than normal, um, but with entirely telephone interviewing was not a bad result. Now I'm gonna hand over to Laura for a summary of our recent incentive experiment. Thank you, Liz. So I'll start by showing you our current incentive on FRS. So we send out a post office voucher to everyone sampled on the survey, and this voucher can be exchanged for £10 at any post office. So on social surveys, there are two main types of incentives that can be issued to respondents. The first type is unconditional incentives, and these are provided to all of the sampled addresses on the survey, irrespective of whether they take part in an interview or not. And then secondly, you can have conditional incentives, which are only issued if the address agrees to participate in the survey. So what does the literature tell us about incentives? Well, there's quite a consistent finding in previous research that unconditional incentives are more effective in terms of boosting response than conditional incentives. However, we wanted to test whether this still applies under COVID conditions, because as Liz has just shown you, COVID had an impact on data 
collection and possibly respondent behaviours as well. With the other reason we wanted to explore conditional incentives is that these can have the benefit of being more cost effective. So in September and October 2020, we carried out a conditional incentive trial. So this was a split sample design and we compared our standard post office voucher against a £15 high street voucher, which was conditional on the respondent participating in the survey. What we found from this test is that the a conditional incentive had a lower response rate than our standard post office voucher. So we decided to build on this research and carry out a further test and this time we looked at the impact of trialling a larger £30 incentive and providing it in addition to our standard voucher. Uh, this trial was run by Natsen only during the January and February 2022 field periods. So we going into the de design a bit more, um, for half of the sample we offered a £10 unconditional incentive which was referenced and included in the advanced letter as standard and for the test group they were given the £10 unconditional incentive but they were also offered a £30 incentive on completion of the survey which was mentioned in the advanced letter. So turning now to the results, uh, we compared the response rate for the control group, which was post office voucher only, to the response rate for the experimental group, which was the post office voucher and the £30 high street voucher. And what we found is that the experimental group had a response rate that was 1.37 percentage points higher than the response rate for the control group. However, this difference wasn't significant. So in terms of what we've decided to do, um, with our incentives. We've decided not to make any change to our current incentive strategy. We're going to stick with the £10 unconditional post office voucher for now, but it's possible we'll look at alternative strategies for boosting response in the future. I'll hand over to Vari now, who's going to talk to you about the return to face-to-face -face led fieldwork. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I'll start with the time scale. So the intention for the rollout for the face to face led approach for, was for it to be adopted in January and the aim then was to reach 100% face to face led field work by the start of the 2022-23 survey year in April. However, due to a rise in cases of the Omicron variant and the associated changes in government guidance, this caused a delay and meant that the launch was postponed until March and approximately Half the sample were offering the new face-to-face -face led fieldwork approach in the first month in March, with the target for reaching 100% face-to-face led now in July. So I'll move on to the interview guidance now. So with an evolving COVID environment, changes to government guidance were implemented in our guidance to the interviewers. And as Liz mentioned before, the protocols adopted for in-home interviewing were developed and tested during the small scale operational trials carried out during the autumn of 2021. So in March, guidance included protocol questions, which were covered with the respondent on the doorstep before making a face to face appointment to risk assess whether the interview should take place. Interviewers were also required to wear a mask in home and whereas the respondents had the choice um, and option to wear a mask. Also, hand sanitizer and sanitizing wipes were available so that interviewers were able to wipe down their packs of laminated show cards between interviews and there was also other guidance as well. So I'll move on to the fieldwork approach now um, and the instructions for interviewers. So firstly we have our previous approach which is the phone-led approach and this is where telephone contact should be attempted on all of the telephone numbers available for each case. And where contact is achieved by telephone, the telephone interview should be offered as the default. Where contact isn't achieved by telephone, the interviewer is to visit the address and where contact isn't achieved on the first visit, they should make visits up until a total of three. So that's once in the morning, once in the afternoon and once in the evening. And then where do doorstep contact is achieved there, the interviewer should collect telephone contact details and offer a telephone interview. So now I'll move on to the face to face led approach that we've been trialling. So all addresses are to be visited and where contact isn't achieved, further visits again should be made until the total three visits have been made. 
For those not successfully contacted after those three visits, contact should be attempted via all contact telephone numbers provided to the interviewer, including portal and telematch numbers. And from there, all respondents successfully contacted should be offered the in-home interview as default. So I will move on to results now from the March 22, 2022 trial. So the March total sample was 2,542 and if I break that down into the two groups, we have the phone led cases with 55% of the sample and the face to face led cases with 45% of the sample. So in terms of response rate, so that is complete interviews as a proportion of eligible addresses, we found that the response rate was four percentage points higher within the face to face group. And this high response may have been driven by a substantially higher contact rate in the face to face group. Um, but overall, we found that 43.8% of interviews were achieved face to face within the face to face led group. So this may be down to respondent reluctance to allow interviewers in the house or interviewers may have lacked confidence to push for face to face in the post COVID environment. But we are looking to encourage for more interviews achieve face to face. Um, so I'll hand over to Liz now uh, to look ahead to 2023. Thank you very much. Yeah, just uh, so, um, three minutes left. That's fine. This is the last slide. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick uh, view of a few of the next steps that we have in mind. Um, so, as uh, Vari's mentioned, we've begun the rollout of face to face. Uh, so that started in ONS in March and um, Nats then followed suit in April. Uh, ONS are aiming for 100 percent by this month. July and NISRA will also be launching face to face in July so it shouldn't be too long before all uh, respondents are being offered a face to face interview. Uh, in other areas we uh, have seen the end of DWP telematching from this month July uh, so that decision was taken basically because of the face to face rollout which decreases the need for that telematching. Uh, similarly, Natsen and Nisra have ceased collection of telephone numbers via a portal and um, they've reverted to pre-COVID approaches and ONS will be considering in the months ahead whether our portal should be retained or dropped. And like um, Vari just said, our major focus now will be on how to encourage greater participation by a face to face. So we'll be exploring um, options to encourage respondent uh, participation by that mode, which uh, include, for instance, explaining to them that the survey is optimised for face to face collection and encouraging them to therefore take part that way if they're comfortable. Uh, and also, like Vari mentioned, we'll be looking at ways to build in interviewer confidence in offering face to face, bearing in mind they've not been doing it for the last couple of years, many of them have joined in the last couple of years so they've never done it and it is a bit more challenging in this new world of uh, respondent reluctance so yeah we'll be looking at ways we can encourage that so thank you for listening and hello and <clears throat> welcome back i hope you had a good break um We'll now um, move on to updates from the Office for National Statistics. Um, so we've got the um, Household Finance Statistics Transformation and Income Earnings Coherence Update with Carla Kidd and Ainsley Wood. So Carla Kidd is the Assistant Deputy Director for Household Financial Statistics Transformation um, at the ONS. And prior to this, she was Head of Wealth, Pensions and Spending Analysis at the ONS. And Ainsley Woods leads on the income coherence um, of GSS income and earnings statistics. We'll then hear from Carla uh, again with a presentation on analytical projects using the Wealth and Assets Survey. And then we'll have um, a presentation on the cost of living analysis with Amory De Silva. So start off with Carla. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here today. So I'm going to start by talking to you a little bit about the Household Finance Statistics Transformation Project. Um, so in April this year, um, ONS 
started this project and it's a three year project, but we do see it running longer than that. And just to kind of give you a little bit of information about what's actually in scope, it's these three surveys listed here. So we have the Living Costs and Food Survey, the Survey on Living Conditions, the Wealth and Assets Survey and Alternative Data features in there as well. Um, so this is the aim of the HFST project and um, this was kind of um, drafted by committee, hence why it's so long, um, but I'll move on to give you the simpler picture. So essentially what we're talking about is we're going to transform towards one survey where we can look at income, expenditure, wealth and living standards, if you like, for the same households over time. And that that one survey is in inverted commas intentionally because at this point we don't know what the design is actually going to be. Um, it may end up being one sample and several surveys coming off it. Um, so that's just a caveat there. And essentially what we want this project to deliver is more timely, better quality statistical outputs. We want to exploit alternative data. We want the surveys underpinning the data to have greater flexibility and responsiveness. And crucially, we want the design and the content driven by what users really want and need. So kind of big picture what, what it covers. If you think about the outputs, at the moment we have micro data from the three surveys which are used both in ONS and outside of ONS. And across the three surveys, there's variable timeliness and there's issues some users have in terms of granularity and other things. But the data that we produce feeds into lots of important things like CPI, national accounts, tax modelling, policy analysis and, and lots of research. Um, the ONS publish outputs on income, wealth, spending, financial resilience and, and, and many other things using these data sources. And the ONS also produces several income publications and outputs from both survey and admin sources. Um, and as you know, so does DWP. So in terms of the vision of the project, what we want is that our household finance statistics are designed to reflect what users want and need, and that we're able to give a holistic picture of financial well-being of the UK population. Alongside that, we want to work towards simplifying the income data landscape. Um, so that it's more coherent and meets users' needs. Thinking about the survey design, at the moment we have three large complex surveys, each with different sample designs, different processing systems. Um, there's issues across the piece with sample size, historic content, timeliness and, and complexity of use. So where we want to get to then is this sort of one survey or sample to look holistically at household finances and demographics for the same households. And we want the content of that to be really user need driven. And we're hoping to move Move away from a kind of survey based approach to a topic based approach so that users are users of our spending data say rather than the LCF specifically. Um, we also want to be quite radical in design solutions not not constrained by the current surveys and processes and we want the design to be flexible and adaptable so that we can respond to emerging needs and then alongside we're also replacing the legacy data architecture and processing systems which although is a very kind of internal ONS thing hopefully for you that means better quality data that we're able to get out to you quicker. Uh, on the use of alternative data, at the moment within ONS, we use some income admin data in our small area income estimates and some of the adjustments on the income um, survey data. And within ONS, there's a very complicated income landscape where we have several outputs produced in a mixture of admin data and survey data. So in terms of the HFST vision, what we want to do is review the alternative data sources for wealth and spending as well and incorporate those for quality assurance and developments as appropriate. Um, where previous focus has been on income question replacement in terms of the use of alternative data, what we want to do is kind of comprehensively assess whether that's feasible and over what time frame, and if it's not, develop alternatives as mitigation. Um, and generally across the piece, we want to use, we want to take, make the most of alternative data to complement the survey data and use it in, in quality assurance and so on. Um, this is just a kind of picture of the work streams that we have on the project. Sorry if you can hear my dog. 
Um, this just kind of shows you the breadth of the project and essentially what it's covering. So we have separate work streams for things like the user needs and statistical design, one for alternative data, um, a specific work stream on coherence and how we're going to decommission the existing surveys. Um, in terms of where we're at at the moment, so as I said, this project kicked off in April, so it's still very much early days, but we have already been doing extensive user engagement. We've been running workshops, a survey and wider engagement, and I've just popped our um, HFST um, email address on here in case you want to um, get in touch. If you haven't heard from us already and you'd like to engage, that would be great. We're also carrying out at the moment discovery exercises. So we're looking at, you know, international and national best practice. And we're establishing the as is picture across the surveys, um, looking at how they're designed, the processing systems and how alternative data is used at the moment. A really important one is that we're also running um, lessons learned exercises. So many of you will be aware this is not the first time that ONS has tried to transform its household finance statistics. Um, so we're, we're learning from those previous attempts um, to avoid repeating the same things again. Um, and also we're working on tactical solutions alongside. So we're redeveloping the processing systems in particular for the LCF at the moment. And we're looking at um, more modern data collection tools um, for the living costs and food survey. In terms of the next steps for the project in the short term, um, we're going to continue work on the tactical improvements and alternative data research. We're going to carry on engaging um, to establish the user needs and, and the business needs that the new design will be um, based on. Then we're going to explore the options for what a future design could look like. Um, and alongside, we're going to have a new external governance structure so that external users are able to feed into the design decisions being made. Towards the end of this year, we hope to have a preferred design option, which we're going to put out for public consultation. And then looking further forward, the, the second year of the project is around development and building any new systems. The third year is pilots and testing. And as I said, it is a three year project, but we do see it continuing in the long term because, as I said, we want it to be um, kind of responsive and adaptable. So um, as, for example, new alternative data comes in or there's emerging data needs in, in the years that follow, we're hoping that we can continue this improvement. And I've um, pop the email address there again, just to kind of really prompt anybody who's interested in finding out more to get in touch with us um, because we'd love to hear, hear from you. Um, I'll just stop there and hand over to Ainsley. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to get my slides up. So it's um, great to be back at the Family Finance Surveys User Conference and um, I'm Ainsley Woods and I am the Coherence Lead for Income and Earnings Statistics. So today I'm going to just talk a little bit more broadly about statistical coherence why, and then sort of really zone in on, on why it's challenging for income and earnings statistics. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of our recent work. Um, we have published an income and earnings coherence work plan. We have an income and earnings um, interactive tool and we have updated an income and earnings statistics guide. I will take you through all of that in a bit more detail. Um, I'm going to talk about um, OSR's Office for Statistics Regulations Review of Income-Based Poverty Statistics, and I've already seen that mentioned a few times by DWP, which is great to see. And then I'm going to cover the what's next for us. So, you know, in terms of statistical coherence, you know, when we talk about that within the office, we tend to use the definition that's on the screen. So it's about drawing together outputs on the same topic to better explain the part of the world that they're describing. You know, this could be across the four nations of the UK or in the case of income statistics, it can be sort of across the different producers. It's worth mentioning that we do have a coherence work program at the ONS um, and there's a link to it if you want more detail, but obviously income and earnings is part of that coherence work program. So, Time now to zone in really on income and earnings statistics and why it's so challenging to achieve coherence in, in this area. 
So first of all, um, as hopefully you're well aware of, there are three main producers working in this space. There's the ONS, there's the DWP and there's HMRC. Um, in terms of then the data that we can use, we can get data from, I'm going to say it's from three main places. We can send surveys to employers, asking them how much they pay their employees which is generally how we get our earnings information. We can also send um, surveys to our employees via household surveys. We can ask them how much they get from um, income and earnings. We can, uh, from, sorry, earnings, sorry. We can also ask them about their other sources of income. And then of course, I suppose, the still relative new kid on the block, but you know, it's been there for a while, is admin data, but we're still very much working uh, you know how best to use that data. So it's sort of the, the new one that's coming on board. When we talk about income and earnings statistics, um, they can be in terms of an individual. You know, we might be interested in how much an, an individual earns. But often, when we talk about income, we um, you know users and producers. You know, are more interested in maybe how much um, a household, what household income might be. And then finally, um, you know, we are we work in different frameworks as well. So there's statistics that exist within different frameworks. So we have sort of a, a micro framework, which is very much where the household survey sit, but we also have the, the macro or the macroeconomic framework, which is basically a system of national accounts. And within that system, of course, we have, you know, we have measures of income, we have measures of expenditure. Um, so that's, you know, another l layer of complexity. And then this is an updated diagram that some people might be familiar with. I'm um, not going to go through the detail of this in, in any way, shape or form, but it just, you know, really, I think, makes it really clear that, that there, there are many different stages as well to think about. Users are interested in, in outputs at different places within this sort of flow diagram. So that's sort of the, the final kind of layer of complexity here. In terms of what we're trying to do um, in terms of our coherence work, so we're really here as sort of facilitators, coordinators, collaborators, bringing producers together, um, getting them to, you know, think about the big picture and getting them to very much think about sort of cross GSS. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that we are most definitely not the output managers and we don't know the minutia of detail that, that those people know. So in terms of our recent work, um, it's worth mentioning that we have what we call our Income and Earnings Coherence Steering Group that brings together senior leaders from DWP, HMRC and ONS. And they sort of oversee, oversee and steer a lot of the work that we do. We have published an Income and Earnings Coherence Work Plan and an associated blog. Um, it's very much across GSS work uh, work plan um, focused on on making improvements in, in five key areas, which I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on in the next slide. We have also launched our income and earnings interactive tool, which I like to describe it as um, a bit of a one stop shop for income and earnings statistics. It's a place where users and even producers, anyone interested in income and earnings statistics can go it's filterable, it's searchable. So you can go there if you've got something specific in mind. You can, you know, use the the filters in the search to find it. Or if, if you're not really sure what you need, you know, you can kind of help um, limit down the the options by by using the filters and things. And then finally, we have updated the income and earnings um, statistics guide, and there's a screenshot of it there for you. Um, if you're familiar with this document, you'll know that it is, uh, you know, it, it pulls together huge volumes of information. So we've refreshed the introduction section of this, updated um, figure one in there, which is that stages of income and earnings that you've just seen. We've included three new outputs that weren't published when um, the guide was first published. Um, we've done a lot of work to refine the information in that guide, um, especially on the strength, things like strengths, limitations and uses. Um, and then finally, we have um, made it clear where we're referencing and talking about income based poverty statistics. So I'm, I'm not going to spend too long in this slide just because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. But so our income and earnings coherence work plan then. I talked about sort of these five key areas, 
Um, and th these are just screenshots from the work plan, which now sits on the analysis function web page. So there's coherence of narrative, coherence of sources, uh, accessibility, quality, and of course, what's at really the heart of what we're doing here is uh, uh, user engagement. Um, OSR's review of income-based poverty statistics. So as a number of people have already mentioned, this was published May last year. Um, and we, we've been doing a lot of sort of the coordination um, and behind all the hard work that, that producers are doing and government departments are doing to address these recommendations. So a number of um, initiatives in our work plan um, already cover some of the recommendations in this report. And we are currently coordinating um, a bit of a progress update. So you've obviously seen kind of a smattering of updates um, through some of the slides that you've seen this morning. We're sort of pulling together a bit more of a comprehensive update against this, which we intend to share with OSR in the autumn. And then I suppose what's next for us? Um, we have um, really a big part of our work, especially I think for the next 12 months or so, is our involvement in the household financial statistics transformation work which you've just seen Carla present about and there is now that coherence work stream which we are leading on. Um, we also have and are doing a bit of work in the space of admin data. We had a workshop recently where we got users together to talk about how they're using admin data to think about how we're working together to use admin data um, and to think about whether there's any synergies in the work that we're doing. Um, as I've already mentioned, we are doing a bit of the coordination um, behind that progress update for OS, against OSR's income-based poverty statistics review. Um, we are very much thinking about updating our income and earnings coherence work plan, but we don't have a clear time frame for that just yet, but watch this space. Um, and then finally, it's worth mentioning that um, we did have done a lot of user engagement in the past 12 months, but we are um, kind of bringing ourselves in under the HFST umbrella because H the HFST project is just doing so much user engagement at the moment, it, it made sense for us to kind of come in under that umbrella. However, we still really do welcome user feedback, user engagement, specifically on um, accessibility and coherence issues. But also, if you've got any feedback on any of the sort of those products that we've shown you, then you know, please get in touch. Please let us know because if we don't have that feedback, then we just um, you know don't know if, if, if the products that we're putting out there are sort of you know suitable for our users, and if there's anything that we really need to be doing to to improve those. So if you do want to get in touch with us, so as I've already said, my name is Ainsley Woods. I've also got Ian Borum and, uh, and my team, sorry, and we have a joint uh, inbox for queries, which is gss.income.earnings at ons.gov.uk. All right, I think I'm going to pass back to Carla now. Yeah, thanks, Ainsley. OK, so we're going to move on, switch gears a little bit now to um, some analytical work that we've been doing. Let me just find my slides. OK. So um, first of all, I'm going to give you um, an update on some analysis that we've done using the Wealth and Assets Survey. I'm standing in for Hilary Mainwaring um, today. She's, she's not able to be here, just mainly so that you can uh, make sure you direct any tough questions her way. That'll be fine. So what I'm going to talk to you about is um, some work we've done looking at inequalities in individual wealth and um, some interesting experimental work that we've done looking at the joint distribution of income consumption and wealth. So we published round seven of the Wealth and Assets Survey, so that's still pre-pandemic data. We published that earlier in the year. And of course, um, you know, as usual, there's still high levels of wealth inequality across GB households with the wealthiest 10% holding almost half of all the wealth in Great Britain. And um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, that's likely to be an underestimate. We know um, that we need to better capture um, the wealthiest end of the distribution. And this uh, release of, of the data and the associated publication was the first time we've taken a kind of in-depth look at individual wealth and the associations with characteristics of those within households. 
So one of the things um, that I thought was particularly interesting was some work we did looking at um, regional wealth inequalities. So previously we've we've only released wealth estimates down to kind of like um, high level regions but this time we used area classifications as well as geographic regions and on this chart here I've just I've just got a breakdown of some of the kinds of um, geographic regions that we're talking about so what what this classification does is essentially it, it puts people in the type of environment they live in um, rather than specifically the region so you might be you know somebody living in a rural area or ethnically diverse metropolitan living um, and, and I think it gives a kind of really interesting additional insight. So if you look in particular at, say, London, whereas previously we might have just reported the wealth for London as a whole, which always kind of comes up you know, very high. This, with this analysis, we're, we're able to look at intra-regional analysis. So, you know, as, as, as we could see that London is a mix of very high and very well, low wealth supergroups. So we have the category of affluent England, where median wealth is around 227,000. Um, but also in London, you also have London Cosmopolitan, which has got significantly lower wealth at 37,000. Um, so that was just kind of interesting way of um, ma making the most, I suppose, of the regional data that we were able to get out of the wealth and assets survey. We also did some modelling, um, so we estimated wealth disparities looking at things like age, sex, ethnic group uh, and so on along that list. And th this was really interesting as well, whereas sometimes um, making these adjustments kind of emphasises the differences in wealth. Um, we, were fa we found that in some cases adjusting for other elements actually kind of got rid of some of those disparities. So the example that I've got on this chart here is if you, if you just uh, in the top chart, this is just what the, the what comes out of the data set. So if you look at average total individual wealth by country of birth, you can see that those born outside of the UK have a lower average wealth than those born in the UK. However, when we corrected for other things, um, that, that difference kind of disappeared, if you like. So suggesting that any difference that they have is, is associated with one of those other characteristics. And we extended this modeling through a whole bunch of different um, characteristics. And, you know, I'd really, you know, suggest that you go and have a look at the publication because there's lots of drop down menus where you can take a look through the modeling results. And I've just put some kind of key ones on here. So when we look, say, for example, at ethnic group, uh, where the white British is the reference group, you can see that there's um, several ethnic groups where the um, average wealth is significantly lower than the white British reference group. That's not to say that those other um, ethnic groups aren't. Um, we do have some issues with sample size um, and you can see by the size of some of those confidence intervals that, um, you know, if, if we had better sample sizes that the results may well be different. When you look at education, um, you know, the difference is, is very stark. So compared to somebody with a degree qualification, somebody with no qualifications is around £200,000 worse off. Similarly, with the disability, with the reference person being somebody who doesn't have a disability, somebody who has a disability is over £60,000 worse off. OK. Now we're going to move to um, an interesting experimental project that we did. So I think it's fair to say that with my HFST hat on as well, in some ways, the holy grail is having spending income and wealth for the same households. And at the moment, you know, that data doesn't exist. So what we did was we um, statistically matched the wealth and asset survey and the living costs and food survey to essentially give us a proxy of that data set. So major caveat is that these are not the same household, the, the same households. Um, they are similar households. So essentially, we attached the spending of a similar household onto the wealth and income data from the wealth and assets survey. Um, and this allowed us to do some really interesting things. Um, so being able to look at somebody's wealth alongside their income and spending um, can, you know, give a bit of additional insight. So on in this chart here in the, in the kind of dark blue, we've got people who are spending more than their income, but have got a buffer to sustain that, but that buffer lasts for less than a year. In light blue, if you these ones expect they spend more than their income, but they can sustain that for more than a year with their financial assets. And then in the sort of mid blue, you have income greater than spending. 
And what we found is that working aged adults living alone and lone parents lacked financial buffers to sustain their overspend. Retirees who spent more than their income had a much greater buffer to fall back on, as you'd expect those retirees have been able to build up some financial assets. But a retired person living alone um, could only sustain that overspend for an average of three years, whereas a retired couple could sustain that overspend for seven years in comparison. Um, we also use this combined data set to put together some poverty indicators. So just to kind of let you know what these indicators are specifically. So we put you as in income poverty if you have less than 60% of median income. The same for expenditure, 60% of median expenditure. And in financial wealth, you'd be in financial wealth poverty if you have a quarter of the income of the poverty threshold in, in financial assets. So. Um, really interesting that sort of a lot of households were in poverty across all three so estimate around two million households and financial wealth poverty was you know the, the most prevalent so that sort of ties into the work on financial resilience where you know how households don't tend to have much in terms of liquid financial assets to cover things like uh, reduction in income um, which is particularly important obviously at for both the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. Um, we also had a look at this by region. So around half of households in the north of England were in financial wealth poverty and the northeast also had the highest levels of income poverty. London and the West Midlands were most likely to be in spending poverty and the West Midlands was most likely to be in poverty for all three measures followed by London, Yorkshire and the Humber and the northeast. So I hope that's given you um, a little bit of a flavour of some of the analytical work that we've been doing um, in the kind of wealth and pensions and spending space. Um, and I'll hand over now to Anne-Marie, who's going to talk to us about household finances and the cost of living. Super, thanks, Carla. Um, can you hear me all right? Great, so I'm Anne-Marie De Silva, and I'm a senior researcher in the Income and, um, Income and Wealth Division at the ONS, uh, and I work on cross-cutting analysis for household finances. So my presentation today um, will be taking you through some of the analysis that, that the ONS has done, um, looking at the cost of the changes in cost of living over the past year. Uh, so I'm going to begin by just taking you through a couple of the options of uh, surveys that we've been using in order to do this analysis. The bulk of my presentation will be uh, taking everyone through um, some of the, the findings that we already have, and I'll end by uh, kind of signposting some upcoming work that we have. So on the slide, you can see some of the, the surveys that have been used uh, to look at the cost of living. Uh, the first survey that's on there is the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey. So that's one of our uh, more rapid, uh, rapid turnaround surveys. It is a fortnightly survey that's administered with about 2,000 to 2,500 households across Great Britain. Um, and there is a fortnightly analysis that's published uh, on our website called the Public Opinion and Social Trends. Um, so you can take a look at that for, for ongoing insight into how, how people are faring, not just on household finances, but on, on several other um, contemporary issues. Uh, the, the rest of my presentation will uh, largely look at findings from the OPN. Um, the other two surveys, the Living Costs and Food Survey and the Household Finances Survey, provide insight on people's spending and income respectively. Um, but these are annual publications. Uh, we're going to be having uh, publications using these surveys uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, so, and I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. So what we've been seeing since uh, data collection in November 2021 is a steady rise in adults reporting a, a rise in the cost of living. Uh, so in November 2021, uh, we saw about six in 10 people uh, stating that they were experiencing a rise in cost of living. And by March 2022, that number had risen to nine in 10. And for the most recent data collection in, uh, in June, uh, the figure still stayed at nine in 10 adults reporting this rise in cost of living. The main reasons reported for higher cost of living uh, has been quite, so quite consistent with the top three reasons being an in order, 
uh, an increase in the price of a food shop, uh, increase in price of gas and electricity bills, and an increase in the price of fuel. People are generally finding um, themselves in difficulty re uh, meeting household, regular household bills. So in particular, energy uh, energy bills, there's quite a few people saying that they, they're experiencing some, some amount of difficulty. So in this reference period in March, there were 43% um, of people, so say four in 10 people reporting that they experienced difficulty. Uh, in, in more recent periods as well, that figure has been about five in 10, somewhat stabilizing. And in March, there was 6% of all people reporting that they're behind on gas and electricity bills. So notably, this is just before the energy price cap changed um, on the 1st of April. Um, the number of people reporting being behind on gas and electricity bills has, has remained somewhat constant since that time, though. We're also seeing that renters have been uh, more, find themselves in uh, relatively more uh, difficult circumstances than, than comparative groups. So there's 13% of renters who report being behind on bills compared to only 3% um, of people with mortgages and compared to 2% 2 of people who own the house that they occupy. 34% uh, of renters reported that their rent had also increased in the, in the previous six months from the reference period. Uh, this also coincides with the same period that uh, showed that rental prices in the UK had gone up. Um, the most since 2016. So this is this is March 2022 compared to 2016. And yeah, so there's there's a lot more renters that are reporting this kind of difficulty in in affording housing costs. Thanks. Next slide, please. There's also some insight that we have about how people. So in in addition to what kind of difficulty uh, people are facing. Um, in paying in paying bills, uh, we also have a measure of financial resilience. So there is a question about how whether or not somebody can afford to pay an unexpected but necessary cost of uh, expense of eight hundred and fifty pounds. Um, what we've seen since November is that the the percentage of people who are saying that they can't afford this sudden expense has been stable since since November. But I think what's interesting is um, when you dive down into the demographics and it's evident that there are people from different demographics that um, are more financially vulnerable than others. So in this chart, you can see one of the um, uh, one of these main characteristics. Um, somewhat unsurprisingly, people on lower incomes uh, more frequently report that they're unable to uh, to shoulder this kind of unexpected expense. Uh, but I, what, what is interesting, I think, is the is the odds ratio. So if you look at anyone earning below twenty thousand pounds per annum, they are between eight and nine times more likely to report that they're unable to shoulder that cost compared to somebody earning above fifty thousand pounds per annum. And then even if you're earning between twenty thousand and thirty thousand pounds, you are up to six times um, more likely to be unable to afford that kind of sudden expense. Uh, there's other characteristics that were studied as well. The second, um, the the second kind of characteristic that showed uh, more likelihood of being unable to afford this kind of expense were, uh, were people on were people who were renting. Um, so there were 53% of renters uh, who stated that they wouldn't be able to afford um, this sudden expense, compared to only 13% of people who owned the house that they occupied. And renters also were six times more likely to be able to, to say that they wouldn't be able to afford this kind of expense uh, compared to only two percent, sorry, two times likelihood for people with mortgages. And this is all in comparison to people who uh, own their homes. Thanks. Next slide, Carla. Hey, um, we've got five minutes, including questions. OK, um, I'll speed up then. So how are people managing this rise? Um, the the main way that they they kind of navigate this is to spend less on on essentials, but they are also doing things like shopping around more to find um, cheaper products. They're using less uh, gas and electricity, but that is also somewhat seasonal because we're, we're moving from winter into um, into summer. And they're also spending less. There's to a lesser extent they're spending less on food shopping and essentials. Um, so since 
January 2022, we've seen an increase in the the number of people saying that they are spending more in order to buy the same amount of goods. Um, and we're also seeing concurrently seeing an increase in the number of people saying that they're buying less when they go food shopping. In terms of management methods, um, something notable is that we haven't seen a significant change in people using credit or borrowing money in order to to manage costs. Um, and we think that this might this could be attributed to to savings built up over the pandemic due to um, force cuts in, in expenditure. Next slide, please. And of course, this has an impact on people's levels of worry. Uh, in by May 2022, we were seeing that three and four adults uh, reported some level of worry about the rise in cost of living, and 80% of those people were um, were thinking about it, were worried about it for several days or more um, in the two weeks prior to uh, to being interviewed. Uh, although there's generally similar levels of worry across uh, Great Britain, some some demographics of people are slightly more um, report being more worried than than others. So women are more likely than men. Uh, people who are aged between 30 to 69 are more um, report more frequent worries than those aged above 70. Uh, disabled people are more worried than non-disabled people. And parents with dependent children under four compared to parents without dependent children. Uh, but these differences are around 10 to 15 percentage points of each other. So that's a glance into some of the insights that we're able to that that we currently have um, at the ONS. Um, but we also have some upcoming work as well uh, to keep on the horizon. So there are two publications coming out in in summer. Uh, there's the family spending in the UK bulletin that'll be out uh, July 18th, and this looks at expenditure um, household expenditures uh, in the financial year 2021. So that covers uh, spending during the pandemic. So it'll provide a good snapshot of where people's finances are just prior to uh, to the change in cost of living. We will also have uh, the publication on the effects of taxes and benefits on income, um, which essentially is what it says on the tin, uh, just looking at how uh, indirect and direct taxes um, affect taxes and benefits affect income. Uh, and we're also looking into some experimental statistics using the household finances survey. So like I said, um, the household finances, we we have annual estimates drawn from that, but we're trying to look into creating faster, um, uh, more timely insights by creating quarterly estimates from there. So we're testing the feasibility of, of creating quarterly estimates at the moment.